Okay, so here we have practice exam two. Part two. This is the part you can use your graphing calculator. All right, so uh, first question on part A. They say find the vertical asymptote. So how do we do that? That's denominator equals zero. Grab the denominator, bring it down here. X to the fourth minus one is zero, so that's x squared minus one, x squared plus one equals zero. And then do you realize that um, this can break down again into x plus one and x minus one? But this guy cannot. He'll come straight down. He doesn't get any simpler. That's kind of a tricky step. Are you aware of that? A lot of people think you can make that x plus 1, x plus 1, but that's not true. If you did that, it would be plus 2, x plus 1 in the middle, which is not what we had. You can only break down when there's the minus in the middle, only x squared minus 1. All right, so we get it all factored down. So now what would make it 0? What could you plug in here to make this part 0? negative 1. What could you plug in there to make this part 0? Positive 1. What could you plug in here to make that part 0? Nothing. Because anything you plugged in, squared would be positive. Add 1 is not going to be 0. Nothing can be plugged in there to make that part 0. So the vertical asymptotes are negative 1 and positive. Whoops. They're negative 1 and positive 1. Okay, so let's try the second part. So y equals x cubed over x to the fourth minus 1. And now we're going to try to um, find uh, part b, the horizontal oblique. Horizontal or oblique. Oblique means diagonal. Are there any of those? What do you got to do for that? You take the highest power on the top, highest power on the bottom. So it'll become x cubed over x to the fourth, because that's what's going to happen as you go way off to the right. And right on a graph, as you go way off to the right, plug in something like a 1,000, all that's going to matter is the most powerful term in the top and the most powerful term on the bottom. So what does that reduce to be 1 over x? So again, when we're looking at horizontal or oblique, we're saying, what does the graph do way off to right, like over at 1,000? If you're plugging in 1,000, the minus 1 is doing nothing. So then you'll get 1 over x, reduces to be 1 over x, and then plug in 1,000, 1 over 1,000, what would that be? Basically 0. Basically 0. One, if I said I ate last night I ate 1,000th of the pi, that was, that's nothing. It's basically 0. So the horizontal y equals 0 is the horizontal asymptote. That means way off to the right, this graph is going to have a zero. Uh, asymptote is going to bring the graph, flatten it down to zero, way off to the right, y equals zero. It's got no oblique. No oblique asymptote, because that means diagonal. If it has a flat one, then it doesn't have a diagonal. So here on number two, we're going to try to factor this one. How does factor? Probably like this, um, minus plus over 5x, x, 2 and 4, maybe 2 here, 4 there, plus 4 minus is minus 6. Yeah, so these cancel, don't they? So this just becomes 3x plus 1 over 5x plus 4. So the vertical, that's for the vertical down here, denominator equal to zero. So if you grab the denominator equal to zero, if you solve that, move the four over. Five x was negative four divided by five. There it is. X is negative four fifths is the only vertical asymptote. What's the horizontal down here for the horizontal? Well, you take that highest, most powerful term on the top over the most powerful term on the bottom. So it's going to become 3x squared over 5x squared, which just reduces to 3 fifths. y equals 3 fifths is the horizontal, and there's no oblique asymptote. There's either a horizontal or oblique. There can't be both. 
So we have a horizontal, we don't have an oblique. Okay, so now we're on to number 9. They're asking me for g of f of negative 1. So how do you do that? First, the negative 1 goes into f. So which one? f is the bottom graph. So that means that's the x value, right? You find the point on the f graph with an x value of negative 1. That's right here. That's the point. Back 1, up 4. That's on the f graph. So that means x value, negative 1, that's what you plug in. What comes out, right? What goes in, what goes out. What goes in is x, what comes out is y, what goes in is negative 1, what comes out is 4. So what comes out is 4. Then that goes into the g graph. So now we go to the g graph, and we find the point with an x value 4. Here's 4, go up to the g graph, boom, right there. What is that? Over 4, up 4. That's the point over 4, up 4. On the g graph, so what comes out is also 4. Let's try the next one. So part B, they say put 0 in the f graph. So go to the f graph, here's the point. With an x value 0, it's over 0, up 3. So that's the x, that's the y. You plug in 0, you get out 3. So what comes out is 3. That goes into the g graph now. Now go to the g graph, find the point with an x value of 3. Here's 3, boom, right there on the g graph. Over 3, up 3. That keeps happening on the g graph. That's over 3, up 3, so you also get out 3. I don't think that's not going to always happen. Let's keep going. How about for the next one? Now we start with the g graph, g of negative 1. goes into the g graph first, the top graph. That would be this point right here, huh? Negative 1 up how much? 5? Yeah, 5. So that means you put in negative 1 to the g graph, you get out 5. So the 5 will go into the f graph now. Now it's 5 into f. Where's that? Right there. That's the point over 5, up 0. On the f graph, so out comes 0. Finally, last one, let's put 4 into the g graph. So find the x value of 4, go to 4, go up to the g graph, boom, right here, that's over 4, up 4. So you put in 4, you get out 4. So then we put 4 into the f graph, and that dot is right here. That's, what is that dot? 4 in the f graph is over 4, down 1, so you get out negative 1. There we go. Okay, so for part A here, they want f of g of x. So that means f of g of x. That means put all of g inside of f. Put all of g inside of f. So what we're going to get is 8 over 5 over x minus 5. Now they're going to ask me for the domain, and remember, whenever you do domain, you want to do domain before simplifying. So do the domain before simplifying. So, so right now I'll take this over here and do the domain before I, I'm going to have to simplify that in a minute, but let me do the domain first. So how do you do domain? denominators cannot be zero. So that means there's there's a couple domains. There's x alone. That, that cannot be zero. And then the whole thing's a denominator. So 5 over x minus 5 cannot be zero. Solve that. Move the 5 over. 5 over x cannot be 5. What do we do there? Put this over 1. Diagonal, diagonal. That means 5 times 1 cannot equal 5 times x. 5 cannot equal 5x. Last step, divide by 5. Oops. So x cannot equal 1. So we've got that x can't be 0 and x cannot be 1. That's the domain restrictions. Now, let's go back over here and clean this thing up. What was it? 5 over x minus 5. So we can't leave it that way. We have to clean it up. So what do you do to, because right now it's, see how it's fractions. This, this is messy. 
fractions within fractions. That's called a complex fraction. It's messy. We cannot leave the answer that way. We've got to simplify it to be just a normal fraction, not fractions within fractions. So what's going to do that? Multiply by x all the terms. See, whatever the denominator is, the extra denominator, just multiply all the terms by that. These cancel. What do you get? 8x over 5 minus 5x. That's just a normal fraction now. So that's the simplified version. That's f of g, and here's the domain of f of g. Okay, so now part b, go into part b. They want g of f of x, the other order. We see we switched it around. This was f of g. Now we're going g of f. So that means we're going to put f into g. So we're going to get 5 over, and in this slot we'll go 8 over x minus 5. Okay, so we got to clean that up, but actually first we should do the domain, huh? Because domain is first before you simplify. So what's it going to be? Denominators cannot be 0. So here's a denominator, x minus 5 cannot be 0, which means x cannot be 5. And the whole thing's a denominator. So that means 8 over x minus 5 cannot be 0. Right? The whole denominator, let's, how do we solve that? Um, put this over 1, diagonal, diagonal. So 8 times 1 cannot equal 0 times x minus 5. 8 cannot equal 0 times these guys is 0. So the x vanished. There's nothing coming out of that part. So the only domain issue is x cannot be 5. Now let's go back and finish cleaning this up. What was it? 8 over x minus 5? Yeah. Okay. So how do we clean this thing up? Because we can't right now see this is fractions underneath fractions. It's a complex fraction. We can't have that. We've got to clean it up. So what do you do? You multiply by that x. That's the extra denominator right there. You multiply top and bottom by that. It cancels there. So then you distribute 5x minus 25 over 8. There it is, simplified. So the domain, x cannot be 5. The function cleaned up, g of f is that. Now in part c... They want us to figure out f of f of x. f of f of x. So that means plugging f into itself. So I'm going to take, take the f of x function, which is that, and plug all of f right in there. So I get what? that. I just plugged all of f into that slot. f into itself. And then we got to clean that up. Okay, so but before we clean it up, remember, come over here, do the domain. You know, first before you simplify. So all denominators equal to zero, not equal to zero. So that denominator not equal to zero, that means x cannot be five and the entire denominator. So that would be 8 over x minus 5 minus 5, not equal to 0. So let's solve that second one, move that 5 over, 8 over x minus 5, not equal to 5. Put this over 1, diagonal, diagonal, 8 times 1, not equal to 5 times x minus 5. That means 8 not equal to distribute 5x minus 25. So now add 25 to both sides, bring it over here. Well, I'm kind of running out of room. It's a crazy problem here. So add 25, what's that? 33 not equal to 5x. Last step, divide by 5x not equal to 33 fifths and not equal to 5. That's the domain. 
Now we also have to uh, finish cleaning up. Come back here to the original. What was it? 8 over x minus 5. Put it back the way it was. Okay, so now we got to finish simplifying, cleaning this up. And so that here's the denom the extra denominator. Multiply every term by that extra denominator. Cancels out here. What do we get? And this 8 distributes. 8x minus, what's that, 40? Over 8, and then the minus 5 distributes. Minus 5x plus 25, and then, hmm, I'm just totally running out of room here, the bottom, this is going to become 8 and 25, so this is going to be um, 33, right? So that bottom will become 33 minus 5x. So, I'm sorry, it's not very clean here. Let me bring it over here, get this out of the way. So the final answer is 8x minus 40 over 33 minus 5x. There's the cleaned up version. Finally, part D, they want g of g of x. What's that? So here's g of x, and they want me to plug all of g into g right there. So I get 5 over... 5 over x. I plugged g into g, into the x slot of g. There we go. Now, uh, we do domain first. Domain first before any simplification. Denominators cannot be 0, so this little x all by itself cannot be 0, and the whole denominator, 5 over x, cannot be 0. How do you solve that? Put it over 1. Diagonal, diagonal, 5 times 1 cannot equal 0 times x. 5 cannot be 0. Well, there's nothing, there's no x anymore. So there's nothing out of this part. So only x cannot be 0. Now let's go back over here and clean this guy up. What was it? It was 5 over 5 over x. So how do we clean that up? This is the extra denominator. So you multiply top and bottom by what will cancel that. And you get 5x over 5. These cancel. It's just x. That's g of g. Okay, let's try factoring this one. Looks like x squared minus 4. x squared plus 4. And then that can be x plus 2. x minus 2. X squared plus 4, right? This part breaks down again, but the x squared plus 4 stays as it is. All over, what's the bottom? Take out a 3x, leaves x minus 2. Because that'd be, yeah, that's right. That'd be 3x squared minus 6x. Okay, can anything cancel? Yeah, the x minus 2s cancel. So, when all is said and done, for the vertical, we just take denominator equal to 0. The denominator is only going to be 3x. Solve for x, divide by 3, x equals 0. That's the only vertical asymptote. What about horizontal? Horizontal last time we take the most powerful term in the top, most powerful term in the bottom, x to the fourth over 3x squared, because that's what happens as you plug in stuff way off to the right. So then reduce that, that's x squared over 3, so imagine we're plugging, we're, we're, we're imagining about a graph going way off to the right, plugging in something like a thousand, or way off to the left, like negative a thousand. What's the graph going to do? Way to the right, way to the left. That's what horizontal or oblique, meaning diagonal, asymptotes answer. So you go way off to the right, you plug in something like a thousand squared over, th over three, it's just going to go to infinity. So that means there's no horizontal. There's also no oblique because as you go way off to the right, the graph's just going to go up to infinity. It's not going to go off level. It's not going to be horizontal. It's not going to go off diagonal. It's going to go rocketing up to infinity. There's no horizontal, no oblique. Okay, so this is a hard word problem. We're talking about a rectangular area adjacent to a river. No fence on the riverside. 
So let me draw it over here. This is going to be number four. We're going to have a river, and we're going to have a rectangle we're building next to the river. The area's got to be 1,000 square foot. I'll come back to that. The side parallel to the river is $8 a foot. The other two sides is $5 a foot. Four corner posts are $25 each. Let X be the length of one of the sides perpendicular to the river. So X is one of the sides perpendicular. So X is this and this, because those sides go perpendicular. They hit the, you know, at a right angle, they hit the river. They go right into the river. Call this other side Y, I guess. We can just make up any letter you want there. And so they said uh, the parallel side is $8 a foot. So this side is $8 per foot, and the other two sides are $5 a foot. And then we have the four corner posts, twenty-five dollars each. Four corner posts, twenty-five dollars each. One, two, three, four. All right. So what's our cost function? Four corner posts at twenty-five dollars each. Right. We've got five x, five x, and eight y. So there's the cost of building the fence. So we can simplify that. That's 100 plus 10x plus 8y. Now, we don't want to leave y in there, so we've got to use another formula involving y. What's that? What's the only other fact we haven't used? Coming back here, we've not used the area as 1,000 square feet. So that would be um, over here in the side, maybe area, which is all the space in the middle is, and what's the area? It's one side times the other, so x times y, right? One side times the other rectangle, area of a rectangle is one side times the other, so it's a thousand, right? Didn't they say a thousand? Yeah, a thousand equals x times y, so I'm going to use that formula. Let me solve for y here, divide by x, boom, take that, plug in right there for y, and so my cost formula will become 100 plus 10x plus 8 times y. What's y? 1,000 over x. There we go. So now um, there's our formula. So let's uh, plug that into your, what, what do they want? Oh, they say, what's the domain? Yeah, real life, the x, the x has to be something greater than 0 because it's the length of a side. So there's the domain. Part C, use your graphing utility. There's your X, there's your Y to, to do that. So put in Y1 equals 100 plus 10X plus this is 8 over 1. So it'll become 8,000 divided by X. Put that into your calculator and graph it like that. That 8 went to the top, right? 8 times 1,000. 8,000 divided by X. Put that in your calculator and graph it. Okay, so I graphed it on my graphing calculator, and I got graph B. It looked like this one. All right, find the dimensions. Now, um, now we got to find right here the minimum, because that's what they mean by cheapest. That means minimum is lowest cost. Minimum cost, cheapest. So we got to find the minimum. Go back here, find the minimum. So do the minimum on your graphing calculator. So when I do the minimum, I find I got the minimum. I got the point 28.3 for x and y 665.69. Remember, that's cost right there. Why? Because y1 is cost. So they're asking for the x, so that would be 28.3, the length of the side perpendicular. Perpendicular is the x. And then they want the length of the other side, the parallel side. So that's not, it's not this y. This y is cost because it came from y1 on my graphing calculator, which is cost. Well, then how do I find, like, the y, this y? I use this formula right here. 1,000 
over x is that y. So it's 1,000 divided by x. What's x? 28.3. Divide that in your calculator. I get 35.3. There we go. Okay, so number five. So we've got this big can here, soda can kind of shape, called a right circular cylinder. It's basically a soda can over here. So uh, what are we supposed to do with it? Um, volume of 500. The top and bottom are three material that's 3 cents per square centimeter. The sides are stuff that's 2 cents per square centimeter. So let's go after it. The cost of the materials on the sides. How are we going to do that? So, well, the cost, you have the top, the bottom, the sides. So let's go over here. This is number five. Cost is going to be the top. Oops, the bottom. Plus the sides. So the top is pi r squared. That's the area. Times the cost of the top, uh, which is 3 cents per square centimeter. Bottom is going to be the same thing. Pi r squared times 0 0.03. What about the sides? The sides, it tells me it's 2 pi r h, 2 pi r h times the material for the sides, which is 2 cents per square centimeter. There's our function. Let's uh, clean it up a little bit. So this is 0.03 pi r squared, and 0.03 pi r squared is 0.06 pi r squared plus 2 times 0.02 is 0.04. Pi r h. Now, the only problem with this formula is we've got an h. We're, we're, we're fine with the r. Of course, pi is, pi is just really a number. Those are fine. Those are really just a number. But we don't want h. So we got to get another formula now involving h and plug in here. What's that going to be? What's the only other fact we haven't used? Volume is 500. Okay. So how, what's the volume of um, this soda can kind of shape. Well, this is a formula you might want to put in your 3 by 5 card. Volume of a soda can, it's always the ground, which is a circle pi r squared, times the height. It's pi r squared. It's whatever's on the ground floor, which is a circle, times the height when it comes straight up like that. So there's the volume formula. So and what they say the volume is? Uh, 500. 500. So 500 is pi r squared h. Solve for h, divide by pi r squared. Boom, boom, there's h. Grab that, plug it in there for h. So what becomes of the cost equation? Cost is 0 0.06 pi r squared plus 0 0.04 pi r and then h. What is h? 500 over pi r squared. There's h. Okay, so we've got to clean that up a little bit. Let's see, so that cost will be 0 0.06 pi r squared plus. Now, 0 0.04 times 500, use your calculator, you'll get 20. And this is over 1, right? So this stuff goes to the top. Kind of running out of room. I don't want to show that one. This pi cancels that pi. This r cancels one of those r's. These r to the one on the bottom. Twenty over r. Or let's just we're going to type it into our calculator now. Just put it like that. Divided by r. So there we go. Type that into your calculator. That's y one into your calculator. We're going to graph it. And uh, when you graph it, and you look back at the graphs, they tell you the window zero to eleven, zero to thirty two. Um, I got this answer. That's what my graph looked like. And then they say, for what value of r is the minimum? If you put that on the calculator, I got 3.76 when I found the minimum right there, the cheapest way to build it, radius 3.76. There's the function. Okay, so question number six. Let's say find the inverse. How do we find the inverse? Step one, switch. 
x and y. So this y becomes x, these x's oops, become y, y is 8y plus 6 over 9y minus 5. Okay, so we switch x's and y's like that, and then we solve step 2. Solve for y, so put this over 1, diagonal, diagonal. So x times 9y minus 5 is 1 times 8y plus 6. Distribute. 9xy minus 5x. Distribute. 8y plus 6. We're trying to solve now for y. How are we going to solve for y? Well, when y is in two places, that's what we have here. It's right here. And it's right here. Step one, get the y's on the same side. Step two, getting kind of scribbly there. Um, factor out y and divide. So I'm going to grab this term and jump it over here. You're going to get the both the y's on the left. Grab this guy and jump him over there. So that'll be 9xy minus 8y and 5x plus 6. Right, The minus 5x jumped over became a positive 5x. The regular 8y jumped over became a negative 8y. Things change signs when they jump to the other side. So check. Get the y's on the same side. Step 2. Factor out the y. So factor out the y and divide. Boom, there it is. That is the inverse function. Now they want me to figure out domain and range for the original and the inverse. So let me go to a fresh screen on that. So the original, what was it? 8x plus 6. Nine x minus five, the, uh, and the inverse function five x plus six. Five x plus six over nine x minus eight, like that. So we have a function, and is inverse. So, what do they want? They want the domains and the ranges. So the domain, well, denominator. Not equal to zero. Jump that over. Divide by nine. X cannot be five ninths. That becomes the range of the inverse, except it's y cannot equal five ninths. Because functions and their inverses, everything switches, so domains and ranges switch also. Over here, the domain denominator again. Not equal to zero. Jump that over. Divide by 9. Bring that over here. Range y not equal to 8, 9. Same thing. There we go. Domains and ranges. Okay, number 7. Let me bring it to a fresh screen here. Oops. x squared minus 1 over 4x squared. Okay, so same thing. They want me to find the inverse. So how do we do it? Step one, switch x and y. So it becomes x out here. Y there. Like that. Okay, so now, on uh, step two, solve for y. So put this over one, diagonal, diagonal. x times 4y squared is 1 times y squared minus 1. So this is 4xy squared. This one distributes y squared minus 1. So now what are we supposed to do? What do we do? We're trying to solve for y. y is in two places. 
these two, get these two on the same side, so jump this guy over. 4xy squared minus y squared equals minus 1. Right? Factor out the y squared. Kind of running out of room here. Factor out the y squared and last step, divide. Well, actually, not the last step yet. So bring it up here. So I've got y squared is minus 1 over 4x minus 1. Now, for the last step, root it, root it, like that. Normally, we do plus or minus. But look back at the beginning. They said x is greater than 0 in the original function. That means y is greater than 0 for the inverse function, right? Because x is and y is switch. So if x is greater than 0 in the original, that means y greater than 0 in the inverse. That means there's no negatives for y. He's only greater than 0, positive only, positive only. So we don't have to do the negative. So you can just forget the signs. It means positive anyway. There it is. So the inverse function, square root of negative 1 over 4x minus 1. That's the inverse function. Now they want the domain and the range for both of these. So let's go to a fresh screen. Four x squared. It's the original function f. And over here we'll do the inverse function, which what was that? Square root of negative one over four x minus one. Okay, so time for domain and range. So domain denominator. Not equal to zero. <clears throat> well, divide by four. That means x squared not zero over four, which is zero. Square root it. X is just not zero, and that comes over here and becomes the range. Y not equal to zero for the inverse function. Now let's do domain over here of the inverse. Okay. Now notice the. Um, yeah, this is a little. Yeah, this is pretty tricky. The, um, yeah, couple couple tricky things here. The, um, the inside of a square root um, has to be greater than or equal to zero, meaning not negative, right? You can't have a negative inside of a square root. So the whole inside here has to not be negative which means greater than or equal to zero. So how do you solve that thing um, greater than or equal to zero? Well, we had a whole complex process, didn't we, where you have to basically graph it. I'm going to need a little more room here. Let me get this out of the way. Let me just take it over here. So minus 1 over 4x minus 1 greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, I'll just leave leave this where it was, range y is not zero. So um, yeah, so how do I solve that thing? Well, I've got to solve this. Well, we learned a whole process where you basically graph it. So you find um, what makes the numerator zero? Nothing, because there's no x up there. Denominator zero, 4x minus 1, makes it, what makes the denom? Denom equals zero. So 4x is 1 divided by 4. x is 1 fourth. That's going to be a vertical asymptote when we go to the graph here at positive 1 fourth. So here at 1 fourth, there's going to be a vertical asymptote. Okay, so now I just need to find out if the function is above um, up here or down here on the left and up here or down here, I mean on the right and the left. So uh, how do we figure that out? We plug in. Pick a number on the right like 1. That's, that's to the right of 1 fourth. Pick a number on the left like 0 and plug in 
to the original function, the y. Imagine there's a y in the front. Find out what that y value is. So what's it going to be? So I'm going to plug in, um, I'll do it down here, plug in uh, x, x equals 1. So then y will equal negative 1 over 4 times 1 minus 1. y will equal what? Negative 1 over 3. It's negative. So that means the graph is down here in this section. Now come over in this area and plug in x equals 0 to test left of the asymptote line. y equals negative 1 over 4 times 0 minus 1. Negative 1 over negative 1, positive 1. So it's positive. That means the graph is up here on the left. So there we have the graph. I, it might seem crazy, like, why am I doing all this graphing all of a sudden? That's the only way you can solve greater than or less than when you have a fraction. Remember, we had a whole section on that, about how you solve greater than, less than when you have a fraction. You have to basically graph it. So where is it greater? They're asking me for where is the thing greater than zero? Well, this section up here is greater than zero, which goes from negative infinity up to one-fourth, doesn't it? Negative infinity up to one-fourth. So the domain is from negative infinity up to one-fourth. That comes over here and becomes the range. In other words, it's y less than one-fourth. And this is x less than one-fourth is what it is. Okay, so number eight, they want me to solve this log question, log base one-fifth of 25. We should just go equal x, because there's no right side, so I'm just going to make it equal to x. And now we need to get rid of the log word. How do we get rid of the log word? Well, remember, logs are inverses of power functions, exponentials. So you make the base one-fifth, that's one-fifth to the log power and one-fifth to the x. And these will cancel out because logs and, and exponentials are opposites. So what do we get then when we do that? We get 25 is one-fifth to the x power. So now can we solve for x? Hmm. What if they said 5 to what power is 25? What would the answer be? It would be 2, huh? 5 squared is 25. So what can we do with a one-fifth? What power needs to be up there? It needs to be negative two. Do you see that? Because one-fifth to the negative two, what does the negative do? It flips it, makes it five over one, and then the two power, five squared, 25, it equals 25. So the x is negative two. That's the answer. On that one. Now there's there's another way. Let me give you a second way using your calculator. If you don't like that, let's go back. Log one fifth of twenty five. You can just make the the top one go top and the bottom one go bottom. Make it two logs. There's a special rule. The one that's on the top, the one that's on the bottom, the top one goes top, the bottom one goes bottom, make it two logs, hit the buttons on your calculator, you'll also get negative two.